on the run. We know that, the Hebrew alphabet. You want to say that together? One more? Uh, we'll say the Hebrew alphabet together. Ali, Ali, Beth, Gamal, Dalit, He, Wa, Zion, Heth, Heth, Yo, Ka, Lamet, Mam, Nam, Samit, Ayan, Hay, Sate, Ko, Resh, Sin, Shin, Pau. All right. Now. The way you actually read Hebrew, you need to realize the Hebrew vowels were not invented until about, I think it was 800 A.D. So nothing in the Old Testament was, was, was pointed in Hebrew. It's called pointed. Pointed. Pointed means it has vowel pointing. They just knew how to say the word. That's why we absolutely do not know how to say the word Jehovah. That's a joke. You, we don't know how to say it at all because it was not pointed. They point it now the way they think it should be pointed. Guessing. <laughs> Guessing. Okay. The ancient Hebrew was not pointed. So that we don't know how they say it. They brought it down with some of the, the part of the biblical grammar is, is more close to what Hebrew sounded like than modern Hebrew. Uh, <clears throat> but now, in your little page there. What page is that in the... What? First page. First page, okay. You have some Hebrew vowels in there. I don't have it in my book. <laughs> no. I, if you... Uh, I should drive one of the other ones. You have full vowels and half vowels. Alright? The way they sound. Uh, you look over there to the left where it says the vowels, full vowels and everything. You have the, uh, the papa, the comets, all right, Shagol, and Herik, Seri, Herik, Yod, uh, Seri, Yod, comets, Hatev, Kibbutz, Holim, and Holim, the effective Holim, Holim, and Shurik. You see all those different ones, that's the way they're sounding. Now, we will read those. And we will read them with the sounds. I've already worked them out. But I just wanted you to be familiar with them. That's all. You can go and look at them. I don't even remember the different sounds. I can sit there and read Hebrew up the storm, but I have not talked Hebrew like this in the vowel form for so long, I can hardly remember the names of the vowels. Because I just don't do it. I just read Hebrew. <laughs> I don't need that. <laughs> all right. You learn how to do it. There are a couple of little things that uh, uh, that you need to know. Uh, go over. Do I have the uh, doggy forty and doggy selenies down there someplace? That's a little dot I tell you about in Word. All right. There's B. All right. Without that, what do you? How do you say that? Huh? That. All right. And. Bet. All right. Bet and bet. All right. So we see that. What is that? That's how. All right. When it ends the word, it'll be a hard. That's what we call soft. And then if you put the, the doggish uh, uh, laning in it, it makes a hard sound. Okay. Now also, what is this word? Lomit. Lomit. All right. Now, there's also called a doggish forte. A doggish forte in some Hebrew letters. And when you put that doggish forte in there, what does it do? It doubles it. It makes two L's. L, L. That's the way it is. You don't have to write two L's in Hebrew. When you do that, it makes it two L's. So we have the doggish lady and we have a doggish forte. All right. The longest doggish lady makes it a hard sound. It, instead of a TH sound, it's a TA sound. Instead of a V sound, it's a BA sound. And there's other letters that it does that, okay? So I thought I'd just throw that at you for good measure. All right? And then uh, there are...
the article, the definite article, the definite article. What is the definite article in Hebrew? Huh? Hey. All right. Now, different point is different. In front are different words. All right. But that's it. That's the. Okay, that's the. All right. Then there's also what we call preposition. Okay. And that is man. Okay. Now, a preposition in front of a word won't be like this. This is the final man, a man and a final man. Okay. But right here, when you have that in front of something, it means from. That means from. Okay. And what about a lament in front of a word? Well, lament. Two or four. Two or four. How about a babe? In. 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 Okay. So here we have little prepositions that are just put in front of the words. In Greek, uh, it's different. Uh, in is a uh, in like that. Okay. And two or four is, uh, well, it could be uh, pros like that, or it can be uh, ace, different one, okay? And then from would be apo. So you have to write it all the way out in Greek, and in Hebrew you just have a letter in front of it, okay? How's that a little bit? Huh? I thought that might be useful to, to introduce you back to that just a little bit. Now let's go to the book of Genesis, 1925. We're still uh, un we're still uh, talking about these ungodly buzzards down in here. Sodom and Amara. Sodom and Amara. What does Sodom mean? Flammable. Amara. Much water. Much water. All right. And this area was like Galilee. In what way? This area was like Galilee. Galilee means what? Circle. All right. So there was a bunch of cities around what we call the Old Salt Sea. And it became the Dead Sea. Remember I told you last week the waters become very concentrated there after God rained. Sulfur upon them. Brim salt. 1925. Why? Yacht. Yes. Now see that word F right there? That F is the sign of the direct object. Okay? Page 84, if you want to write that down underneath yours if it doesn't have it. And it's F with a TH on the end of it because why? It does not have the little dot in the middle of it. Okay? And then ha ha arim. Ha'el, we f. All right, and there we have a conjunction in front of the direct sign of the direct object. See the with there? With that with is an. Okay, we f. Call. Ha kikar. Now here is the word that is like Galilee, the circuit. All right, we f. Yeah. Call Yashabi He Arim Wet and Mach. Okay, now that Mach, if you, it's got a CH sound on the end of that chat there. See, it's got a chat at the end of it. We at Mach. And then Ha Adam Mach. Ha Adam Mach. Ha Adam and Dom are very closely related, aren't they? All right. And he overthrew. And he overthrew and kept on overthrowing the, the, overthrowing the city. The city. Hamarim. Several cities. It wasn't just Sodom and Gomorrah, but several cities in the area. I believe five cities all together were destroyed. Ha'al. The bees. And we at and call call is what call means all, all right and all the circuit 
all of the circle around there, all around what was called the Salt Sea at that time. We have, and all Yoshive, and all the uh, all the ones sitting. Look at that. All the ones sitting, masculine, plural, cow, participle. All the ones inhabiting or setting of the cities and uh, and the sprouting or the growth of the ground. Everything sprouting out of the ground, everything growing, everything that was alive was destroyed. Completely destroyed in this whole area. All destroyed. Deuteronomy 29, 23, and Psalm 107, 34, Isaiah 13, 14, uh, 2 Peter 2 and 6, all cross reference to this. We're going to look at some of these in just a little while. The sign of a defiant, rebellious people. All right? The sign of defiant rebellion. Wa-ta-bet. Ishto. Ishto. Mi-atro. Mi-atro. Wa-ti-hi. Wa-ti-hi. Nitsif. Nitsif. Milak. Milak. All right. And looked. And she looked. And she kept on looking. And she kept on looking his wife from behind him, from behind him in a defiant manner. All right, from behind him, she is defying her husband. She is going to do it exactly. She is defying God. She is defying her husband, and she's going to look anyway. And she keeps on looking away and behind him defiantly. And she became and kept on being. Uh, Nitziv, a pillar of Milah. So, now around this place there's a lot of salt pillars. One great big salt pillar they call Lot's Water. Luke 17:32 and Genesis 19:17 cross references to this. 19:27. 1927. Boy, that was a good year. 1927, America was wild. Wayashkim. Avraham. Bob Boker. El. Amakom. Asher. Ahmad. Sham. Et. Hanei. And then we have the word Jehovah, which is where you'll say Hall of Ah. Okay. And broke through and rose up early and rose up early and kept on rising up early. Abraham in mourning. And this, uh, the word mourning there, Bob Oker, you get the word uh, draft animal from this. Because a draft animal, you, you drag a plow and it breaks the ground open, doesn't it? And the light of day breaks open in morning. It begins to come up. The light begins to come up. That's the idea of the Hebrew here. To break, the, to break daylight. To, for daylight to break. Alright? For daylight to break through. I remember when I lived in Nevada in Fish Lake Valley. It would be cold in wintertime up there. I have seen the 30 below zero once the mother. Okay? Sometimes I would go out in the morning, not 30 below zero, but maybe 10 below zero. I would go out there in my bare skin, just with shorts on. And I'd let that sun hit me in the morning. And that felt so good. And I'd look at that, and I'd thank God for the sun. And I'd thank God for His power every day that he never failed to make the sun go up, come up every day. The power of his strength. That sun, you know, when you live in cold country like that, you realize everything is asleep in the winter. And until that sun comes up and stays warm, it's not going to 
it's not going to wake up. All the trees, you know, here in, in Bakersfield, you don't have winters, really. We have winters, but we don't have winters. But when every weed dies, every bug has gone to sleep, I guarantee you, you're not going to find a fly flying around in January if it's like out. Everything's asleep. This sun, when the sun comes up and stays with its full power, it brings forth life. Even the bug and the, the grass comes back up. It breaks forth. Everything breaks forth from the ground. The grass breaks forth. That's the word bavoker. Bavoker. It means to break forth. So remember that. If you remember when the grass comes up in the spring, when the every morning when the when the uh, the sun breaks over the mountains and comes up, that's what it means to break forth, to plow forth. Okay. In the morning, unto the place, Hamakom, the place, the standing place, where Hashir, where he had stood, third person masculine singer Cal Perfect, where he had stood there, Shaw. And that F is just a sign of the direct object. We have some power going that way. In face of Jehovah. All right. In face. Pene. Face. In face of Jehovah. In the presence of. In the face of Jehovah. In the, in the Greek, in the New Testament, is prosopon. 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 In John 1 and 1, it says, In the beginning kept on being the Word, or the Word kept on being in the beginning. And the word kept on being proton theon, toward the God. That means toward the face of God. Jesus kept on being God. He never ceased being God. Even though he was our Savior, he never ceased being God. And that's the idea, the face to face. God looked, about, looked down upon the faces of Sodom and Amorah. The faces of them, the expressions of them, the attitude of them. When you look at somebody's face, sometimes you can tell what he's thinking, can't you? Or she's thinking. Okay. Faces, expression, anything. That's what you call what? Body language. All right? The faces of Sodom and Gomorrah. Why Yash Shak. All. Penei. Zedol. We Amara. We all. All, Mane, Eretz, Hakikar, Wayal, Wikane, Allah, Kippur, Haaretz, Ki, Kid, Tar, Hakib, Hakib, Sham. And he kept on looking upon the faces of Sodom. He kept on looking upon the faces of Sodom. Sodom means flammable. And Gomorrah. And Amorah. Where did we get the word Gomorrah from? Where did the word Gomorrah, since it's Amorah here, where did we get the word Gomorrah? Where did the word Gomorrah come from the pronunciation of Gomorrah? Where did the origin originate? The Septuagint. I found LXX up there. The Septuagint. That's where it came from. It did not come from the Hebrew. It came from the Greek. We all. And upon. We all. All. Every or all the faces. All the faces of the land. Land has a face. The land has a surface. And the surface is the face. In Genesis 1, it says, And Spirit God hovered over the faces of the deep. The faces of the deep. So here, we see the faces of the land. And the circuit, which means all around the Dead Sea. And he saw, and behold, look at that. And he saw and kept on seeing, and behold, had gone up in smoke in vapor, in steam, the land, like vapor of a smelting oven. A smelting oven. A smelting oven is like a, uh, a forge. How many of you ever seen, well, 
How many of you have ever seen a forge? Anybody ever seen a forge? You've seen a forge? you got to have gray hair to have seen a forge, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I, I lived over east of Bakersfield next to a stable, and, and I'd wake up on uh, <coughs> the weekends a lot of times, or, or and I'd hear an anvil ringing over there, and the old blacksmith, had, I could smell that brimstone, that coal. You could smell it. It would drift sometimes there. And you could smell that brimstone, the coal from that forge. And I could hear that anvil ringing. That's the type of smelting here. This is really strong fire. This is a heated fire. <coughs> it talks about an oven smelting. A smelting oven is a forge. Forge. In a forge you heat metal and melt it. A long time ago, when they were drilling these old, old oil wells out here with cable tool rigs, they had great big, uh, uh, heavy tools, and they would take them up and down uh, in a well, and they would just sit there with a jack, a jack hammer and go bam, 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 and they just beat the ground down there. That, that's before they had what we call rotary drills, and they beat and beat and beat. Well, the, the rocks and everything back there would beat the sharp edges off of it, so they pull them out of the ground on a cable tool rig. You go out there, and they had great big forges. And they take these great big pieces of metal, some of them as big as that table right there. And they take with the equipment and they put that heavy metal in a forge and they take large sledgehammers and they heat other metal in this forge. This is the kind of oven this is now. This is the forge. And they would put this other metal in there and they didn't have welding. They didn't have electrical welding. They didn't have acetylene welding back at this time. They really had begin to use it at that time. So they take this metal, they dip it in what you call borax. You know the borax, U.S. borax out here by Mojave? They had this borax there and they would dip these heavy pieces of metal in there so they were completely covered and the metal were like white hot and they take a hammer and they beat and make sharp edges back on these cable tool bits. That's the type of heat that is here. God melted this place. I had a friend by the name of Walter West that worked for George Bush Sr., Marathon Oil Company. And they went over in the Middle East and they did some core drilling near the Dead Sea. And he drilled down in that area and took core drillings of the area and they found down deep in the ground, they found pottery that had been melted like glass. It was so hot. That's this. You take glass and you put it in a forge and it's going to disappear. It's going to melt. It's melt. Everything will melt in this type of a, of a smelting oven. A smelting oven has a blower on it or a bellows. Some of the old cowboy movies you see, you see somebody out there taking the big bellows. And it will be blowing. You use coal and then you blow air to it. And the air makes it burn hotter and hotter. So somehow or another, this was like a smelting oven like a forge. Alright, like a forge. I just sold both of my forges here the other day. I didn't think I was going to do any more blacksmith. I got rid of them. Why he? 1929. Why Sha Chi. Be Sha Chi. Elohim. Ha. Hawk. Kick. How would you say that? Wasn't the area around Galilee, the Sea of Galilee, in circle? That's the same thing right there. Galilee comes from that. Why is Kaf? Elohim? Yep. Abraham? Now look at Abraham there. It's not Abraham, it's Abraham, Because it doesn't have the little dip in the bait. Abraham, why? Shalah. Do you see the dip in the middle of that lament? That means it's double L. All right. Et. Lot. Nit tok. Ha ha fika. Va ha folk. Now see it? That hey there? does not have that bit in it, does it? So it's a pH sound, not a P sound. F. Ha. 
Harim. Asher, Yashab. See, faith doesn't have a, a dead in the middle of it. So it's Shab. All right. Bahen. All right. Lot. That's one of the things. See how this teaches a little bit less out of time. Wahi. And became and kept on becoming in destroying. Look at the word destroying there. Look at the tense that that's in down below. Somebody read that tense for me. Can you read my writing there? Cindy, what does it say? PL tense. What is what does PL mean? Something that's very progressive and very powerful and very intense. PL infinitive construct. All right. In destroying, powerfully destroying gods. The whole triune God here is talking about Elohim. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit has taken place, taken uh, vengeance out on this flesh. If all right, cities, the circuit that remembered third person masculine singular cow well consecutive and perfect and remembered it, kept on remembering God, the triune God, and Abraham. Washallah. And sent. Shawah is what it comes up. Third person, master, singer, PL, while consecutive and perfect. And sent Lot. How did he what did he do to Lot? Remember what he did to Lot? He arrested him and, and basically handcuffed him and drug him and those wife and his wife and daughters out of there. They had to be manually, they had to be aggressively arrested. Not just stopped, but arrested and hauled off. And Lot. Look at that word et there. See that powerful third person might have seen their PL while consecutive and perfect. And he kept on sending, kept on kicking out Lot from the middle. From the middle. What does Lot mean? What does Lot mean? Secret or hidden or dark. All right. Well, I'll tell you what, it was a dark secret that, that Lot was a Christian in that city, wasn't it? He was, but it sure was a dark secret. The overthrow. In throwing. The overthrow in throwing. Call, infinity construct, the cities. Which, sitting or dwelling, Third person, last and seen or child perfect, having sit and dwelled in them, walked. He just kept on sitting and kept on dwelling. This was the end of Lot's temptation. The end of it. Now let's go uh, to uh, Deuteronomy, the seventh chapter. And we'll look at that for just a minute. Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy means what? Deuteronomos. What? The second law. All right, Deuteronomy 7. By the way, we get the word Deuteronomy from what? The Septuagint. All right, the Septuagint. Deuteronomy 7. 7. The Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you were more in number than any of the peoples for you were the fewest of all peoples. He's talking about Israel now. But because the Lord loved you and kept the old, which is for to your fathers, that the Lord brought you out by a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the, from the hand of the king of Pharaoh. Know therefore that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God, who keeps his covenant and his loving kindness to a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. And he repays those who hate him to their faces see that Panay, to their faces to destroy them and he will not delay with him who hates him he will repay him to his face two things we learn from this this verse right here are these verses that God is faithful he loves his people God is ungodly as Lot was God loved Lot he loved him as ungodly as Lot was God loved him now, 
<coughs> and then he and, and these other people were ungodly and he hated them. They weren't his. They weren't his. Every life was fleeting, isn't it? You don't have one heartbeat ahead of the other. You know that? You just really don't. I have seen people in perfect condition. My friend, Brother Soul, that was one of the hardest men I've ever seen. The most, one of the most powerful men. He was just like touching his body. Was like touching that wall. He, he was like made out of iron or something. He worked out. He he worked out. He did martial arts, and uh, I had him preach for me a couple of times. And, and he would walk in the in, into the pulpit. He would take his shoes off. He was Korean, and. Uh, He'd walk up there and he'd hit that pulpit and I thought he was going to just, that pulpit was going to fall off like the splinters. And he'd preach in a powerful way. In a powerful way. That man went back to Korea. And I think within six months of being on the Korean field, after he received his doctorate, he was going to go start a seminary, he dropped dead. Power. We don't, we aren't guaranteed a heartbeat. And if you're lost, boy, you're on dangerous ground. If you're saved, what you do with your life matters. What lot did with this life matter? It really mattered. And uh, in Second Peter two, Second Peter two, and verse six, go over there. Second Peter two and six, and then we'll go back to Deuteronomy again. Second Peter. I can find it. Second Peter two and four. For if God spared not the angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell, and committed them to pits of darkness, pits of darkness, so phone scotia, pits of darkness, and reserved for judgment. And he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the faces of the whole world, the world of the ungodly. And he condemned the cities of God, Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes. What was that furnace like there? Like a forge. Like a blacksmith's forge. Reducing them to ashes, having made them an example to those who would live ungodly. Thereafter, Sodom and Gomorrah ought to be example to every rat and homosexual in the world today. He still doesn't like that. He still doesn't like the behavior. How that they shake their fists at God. How he rescued righteous Lot. Look at that. How he rescued. He snatched. He rescued righteous Lot. Look at that. How he rescued righteous Lot. He snatched righteous Lot. Oppressed by sensual conduct of unprincipled men. He was oppressed by it. Aselgia is the word there in Greek. Aselgia. You know what aselgia means? Unbridled lust. Unbridled lust. <coughs> Unbridled lust. How many of you ever gone to Rhodes? Okay. They have a saddle bronc and they have bareback bronc riding. Something. And in the bronc riding, you have a rope tied on the halter of the horse. And you're riding. And you're holding on to that rope. You know, you're not supposed to drop your hands down so far. You have to hold on to this rope. And you just spur and you ride this animal. But there is some control a little bit over the animal because you got a rope on all of it. How about the bull riding? 
How about the bull rider? Nothing. Yeah. You know that they could do that with a bull, too. You know how they used to control bulls? Mm -hmm. A ring in her nose. They put a ring in her nose. And they lead them around very, I didn't take a whole lot. Put a little rope on there, just a little string on the bull. You could lead a, string, a bull around by the string. Because I'm going to tell you something. When you pull on your nose, that hurts. Same way with pigs. They could take a pig. And a long time ago with carts, a lot of times they could holler G or ho, which means left or right, with animals if they didn't have a bridle on. But they would poke them on one side and make them go the other side with what is called a go. Or they would have just two light strings on that ring on one side of the opposite face on the other and just pull just a little bit and go that way. Those bulls in the rodeos don't have any rings in their noses. What do they do? Anything they want to. <laughs> there is, it's unbridled. They're unbridled. They're just twist and run and go any direction they want to. If they had a string in their nose with a ring, I guarantee you they could pull them one way or the other. But they're unbridled. Unbridled lust. I tell you. Unbridled. And he rescued righteous Lot. Boy, we wouldn't know much about Lot being righteous if God didn't tell us here, would we? This thing about the, the dude. What about him? What about his behavior? Did he any, do anything that you can see in the Old Testament? Did he do what? Was he a preacher? He was, a, he was in the highest place of authority in Sodom and Gomorrah in the cities. He was in the court. What did he do in the court? Like everybody else. They didn't know him from anybody else. But he knew what they were, didn't they? When the angels came in there to visit him, what did he tell them? Don't stay out here in the marketplace. Don't stay out here in the middle. Not tonight. Come in my house. They said, no, 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 no. I will say, no, don't you do that. Because he knew exactly what they were. He knew what it was. Let's see. And he snatched, rescued, righteous law, oppressed by unbridled lust of unprincipled men. For by what he saw and heard, that righteous man, while living among them, felt his righteous soul tormented day after day with outlaw deeds. With outlawers. Lawlessness. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation. Did he? He got him out of there. He destroyed his temptation, didn't he? He's gone. To keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment. Verse 10. Boy, I tell you what, Peter's quite a preacher. He's quoting the book of Enoch in quite a bit of what he says. And especially those who indulge, indulge the flesh. Look at that. The words indulge the flesh go after, seek after, lust after the flesh. It, it's corrupt desires, despise authority, daring self-will. Did this describe Sodom and Gomorrah? They, do you think that those boys and those old men and young men that came up to the, to the door of Lot, do you think that they knew there were angels there? No. Hmm? I think they did. The angels that they had anything to do with before that, remember there's a bunch of giants around here. They were inbred from the giant race. What they had seen among the angels before was ungodly, oselgia, unbridled lust. That's what they had seen before. So they expected these. But these were godly angels. These are God's angels. God's angels. They conduct themselves in a godly manner. Because they are always in the presence of God, it says. And they were on a mission. Talk about mission impossible. <laughs> Remember, there used to be something on television called Mission Impossible, I think. I never saw it, but I heard about it. This mission was not impossible with these angels, but these people tried to stop them. Daring, self-willed, they do not tremble when they revile angelic magistrates. 
Look at that. Archangel. They revile. They blaspheme. Angelic magistries. Archangel. Archangel. All right. Archangel. Whereas angels who are greater in might and power do not bring a reviling judgment against the Lord before the Lord. But these, like unreasoning animals born as creatures of instinct to be captured and killed, reviling where they have no knowledge, will in the destruction of those creatures also be destroyed. Hard, hard language, isn't it? He's quoting the words of Enoch. The book of Jude quotes the words of Enoch. If you read the book of Enoch, you will see him using the same language as Peter is using here. All right, let's go on to uh, Deuteronomy, the ninth chapter. Deuteronomy. What does that mean? Second law. All right, Deuteronomy, the ninth chapter. way back up to verse 1. Hear, O Israel, you are crossing over the Jordan today to go into a dispossessed, to dispossessed nations greater and mightier than you, great cities, fortified to heaven, real high. People, great and tall, the sons of the Anakim, who were these now? The Nephilim. These are the half-breeds. These are the demon angels and, and uh, human crossbreds. Whom you know and whom you have heard it said, who can stand before the sons of Anak? Now therefore today, that is, the Lord your God, who is crossing over before you as a what? Consuming fire, like a blacksmith's forge. Remember that. Consuming fire, a blacksmith's forge will melt anything you put in it. It'll melt it. It'll melt it. He will destroy and drive them out and destroy them quickly, just as the Lord has spoken to you. Do not say in your heart, when the Lord your God has driven them out before you because of my righteousness. Pay attention to this. Because of my righteousness, the Lord has brought me in to possess this land. But it is because of their what? Poneria. Their wickedness. The wickedness of these nations that the Lord has dispossessing them before you. Go back in the in the book of Genesis again. Back in the book of Genesis, as God was speaking to Noah, when Ham sinned against Noah, when he was speaking to Noah, what God inspired him to say some words. And he said, let's go back. There. Hold your place right here and go back to the book of Genesis and see if I can find it quickly. <clears throat> Genesis 9, verse 18. Genesis 9 and verse 18. Now the sons of Noah who came out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. What's Shem mean? Name, monument, pillar, Ham. The ark. Swarthy. All right? And Japheth. What's Japheth mean? To spread out. All right? Light to spread out. And Ham was the father of Canaan. Ham was the father of Canaan. Look at that. Now cross references over here where we are, okay? Because this is very important. Canaan, the land of Canaan. And these were the sons of Noah. From these, the whole earth was populated. All right, scattered literally. Now Noah began farming and planted a vineyard, and he drank of the wine 
actually the great Jew, and became drunk and uncovered himself inside his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Now, in the language here, he might have even gone in there and committed a homosexual act. And Ham, the father, came and saw the nakedness of his father and told his brothers outside. Not only did he see him, not only did maybe he did something wrong and immoral. And remember, he's a married man, too. He's a married man with children. And Shem and Japheth took his garment and laid upon both their shoulders and walked backwards and covered the nakedness of their father and their faces were turned away so that they did not see their father's nakedness. Now, it is said that before the flood, maybe the laws of fermentation did not work in, in grape juice like it did afterwards where it produces wine. Things didn't rot. The world changed after the flood. What, what changed after the flood? What are some of the things that changed? Still eating meat. Still eating meat. All right. Animals started eating each other. They didn't do that before. Look. The fear of man was placed in all of the what they call the ther theron, the swift lung running out, the deer and uh, the, the leopards and all this. They began to fear man. Before that, they were companions of man. What else happened? Maybe the communication. Too. The communication. They quit communicating like they had before. Now you can still communicate with animals. I had a golden retriever one time. Anybody here have a golden retriever? They're smarter than a witch. Boy, they're smart. I had one, I, well, I had three of them I called Brandy. The one I traded the chicken for, he was the, uh, he was a mascot at the Johnsonville Sawmill. This is a long time ago. Johnsonville Sawmill hadn't lived there for a long time, but he was a mascot. And I went in there, and this dog was running around through that, and the guy traded me. It was his dog, and it was a paper golden retriever. And they had used him to uh, retrieve ducks in, in water. I took him out, and he would point a quail. You could herd rabbits with him. He'd take a rabbit and run right back to me. I'd shoot the rabbit. I even caught a deer with him one time. I got out there and bulldogged the deer. I said, Brandy, go bring him here like this. And I could go bring, I could say, bring him here, and he'd do it by voice, and I could go like this. I could go out there when I was in the field with the rabbits or whatever else, and I could tell him to run back. He'd make a, a pheasant fly toward me. He was smart. He would herd sheep. He was a cattle dog. He was a coon dog and a lion dog a bear dog. I took him out subtle and refiner when I was out there. I never saw an animal that communicate like that one. And I just discovered how smart he was. He was smarter than I was. He would go out there, he, I'd take him to work with me, and he, in the hot summertime, he was sitting in that car. You know how it is here in Bakersfield. He was sitting in that car. And I'd go out there and I'd say, Brandy, get under the car. Get under the car. And he'd get underneath my pickup. And he'd lay underneath the pickup and he'd shake him up on the bottom of it. You know, water down in front of the drain. He wouldn't leave that truck. You couldn't force him to leave that truck. I was out there on a, a loading rack. I climbed the tanks, and Brandy would be right up the tanks, right behind me. People walking out there like that. And the truck driver would come in there, and I'd fill their gasoline truck, diesel truck, whatever they wanted, and I'd be up on the truck. And wherever I was in that refinery, if that dog was in that truck in the wintertime or under that truck, his eyes were on me. If wherever, wherever I moved, his eyes were there. And I could go like this. And that dog would come out of there just like a, a horse out of a chute. Flying, tearing the ground up right to me, and he'd sit right at my feet. And I could say, Brandy, go get in the truck. And he'd go get in the truck. If I say, Brandy, go get under the truck, he'd get under the truck. I could say, I could go like this. And point, and he'd go get in. I'd just go like this, 
and point, and he'd go get up. When I was herding sheep or whatever we were doing, hand signals, or I could call him and tell him what to do. This, that, that dog was something else. Jim, tell them about when somebody walked up there and wasn't supposed to be there. If somebody walked up to my truck that wasn't supposed to be there, you'd think a lion was there. <laughs> I mean, he was, he was the most vicious dog that I ever saw. He would kill somebody. One time in my yard, a hobo came in the yard, and he was over there trying to, to steal something in the neighbor's yard. They would come, we lived not too far from the railroad tracks. And a man came up in the yard. He was over there in my neighbor's yard and trying to steal something. Well, I had to go pick him up out of the dog pound. They had picked him up because he, in my yard, a hobo had come in my yard and he broke the guy's arm when he tried to get in the house. We didn't even lock the house. We had a locked house for there I guarantee you. I could put a million dollars in the back of my pick and nobody could tell you. That dog. That guy come over there and I saw this patch on his arm cast and everything like that. And I hollered at him and said, what are you doing over there in my neighbor's yard? And he said, none of your business. <laughs> well, I knew that this had to be the guy because he's been trying to break in houses up and down there like that. I said, if you don't get out of the yard, I'm going to sick this dog on you. And I mean, that guy took off running, boy, like a street. I told all that story that animals can read your mind here. Before the flood, animals communicated with mankind. There is there is communication there with horses and with dogs and even chickens and birds and even fish. I have even trained fish. Have I trained everything on the place, Meryl? Yes. Or else it trained even a duck. Even a duck. There's communication there that you don't get otherwise. That, that you miss so many times that was there before. Okay? Now let's look at this guy. Look at what happened here. Let's go back to the story. Well, there were two good boys and one bad boy. So to speak. One bad boy and two good boys. When Noah woke from his wine, from his drunk, he knew that his youngest son had done to him. Evidently, he must have done something physical. Okay? And he said, Curse be Canaan. Now, who would this man become? Who would, this can who would these Canaanites be? Hmm? In the land of Canaan, this is who we're talking about over here in the book of Deuteronomy. These are the, the progeny of these people. Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants. Now, he's not cursing Ham. Ham is the father of all the dark races, the Hamites. All the dark races are the races that went out into the world and invented. They were the trailblazers and they were the ones that invented almost every invention that was ever invented. Okay? They're not cursed. In Southern Baptist churches, 200 years ago, 100 years ago, they used to look upon down upon Negro people and say they are supposed to be slaves. They're supposed to be. They believed in segregation and all this. They are supposed to be slaves because this right here, God cursed Ham. Now, what does the Bible say? Who did he curse? He didn't curse Ham. If he cursed Ham, he, no, if he had cursed Ham, he would have cursed himself because that was his child. He cursed one of his descendants because God knew what they'd be like. He knew what these rats would be like. They would be like the Sodomites because they went into that land and that's the way they were the land of Palestine. A servant of servants he shall be to his brothers. And he also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. Let Canaan be his servant. Shem. Now how would Canaan be Shem's servant? Because they would go into the land. And why did God chase all those people out? And why did he call for their destruction? Because they had cohabited with angels and animals and everything else. They were full of disease. And full of idolatry. God of shame. And let Canaan be his servant. And may God enlarge Japheth and let him dwell in the tents of Shem. And let Canaan be his servant. It doesn't say anything about the rest of the Hamites, does it? Southern Baptists were a little bit wrong, weren't they? That's all I got to say about that. I get back over here in the ninth chapter of Deuteronomy. 
See, you got to taste these other rabbits before you can understand what these verses are all about. The Bible is a great big book. You can go look at one verse and you can spend a week studying one verse sometimes. Where do we end up here in 9? 9 and verse 4. And do not say in your heart, when the Lord your God has driven down out before you because of my righteousness. He didn't do it because of your righteousness. He did it because of Canaan. The Lord has brought <clears throat> driven them out before you because of my righteousness. The Lord has brought me in to possess the land, but it's because of what? The evil and the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is dispossessing them before you. They have become Shem's servants. This is a fulfillment of the curse that God used through Noah about these people because he knew these people would be, they were homosexual, they were ungodly, they were idolaters. He knew that all this would, and it, and it kept saying, their fullness of their wickedness isn't finished yet. They're going to get a lot worse. And when I send you in there to kill all these rats, I want you to wipe every one of them out, man, woman, child, and dogs, and cats, and cattle, and sheep, and goats, and everything. I want you to, because they were all diseased with diseases. Now we look back and they check the DNA and think, these people were full of disease because of their ungodliness. It is not for your righteousness or for the uprightness of your heart that you are going to possess the land, but it is because of the what? The wickedness of these nations that the Lord your God is driving them out before you in order to confirm the oath. The oath. Who made the oath the first time? It goes all the way back to Noah people. God promised Abraham that he was going go in here, but he told Noah what was going to happen hundreds of years before that. The Bible is a book that is tied together. <clears throat> Marilyn likes to crochet things, don't you? When you get to the end of that crochet and you have a whole thing done, can you pull on that string and just unravel it all? Mm -hmm. Huh? No. When you get to the end of it, you, you can't. can't with knitting. Huh? You can't with yeah, knitting. That's the word, knitting. When you get to the end, when you're knitting something, you can pull it. If you've ever had a speed sack or anything like that, you can pull one string and it just unravels all of it. Yeah. If you pull the right string in the Bible, you can unravel and all of it makes sense. All the way through the book. All the way through the book. You open doors. Languages open doors to the Word of God. That, you can just see more and see deeper. No, then, it is not because of your righteousness that the Lord your God is giving you this good land. For you are a what? Hard-headed, stubborn people. Remember, do not forget how you provoked the Lord, your God, to wrath in the wilderness from the day that you left the land of Egypt. You know, God got Israel out of Egypt, but it took him a long time to get Egypt out of Israel. They kept that smell, that idolatry, in them and in their habits. Until you arrived at this place, you have been rebellious against the Lord rebellious against the Lord. Let's go back now. Now that we've got a handle on this a little bit better, what's going on here? 19 and 30. Is that a good year, Marilyn? 19 and 30. What? <laughs> Jesus. I said, was 1930 a good year? I don't know what was that. <laughs> no. Why, why you all... All right. Lo. Mitz. So swar. Why ye chef? Why ye chef? Lahar. Yush. Yush. Chop. Van Nato. Emo. T. Yare, Lashedet, Batsawal, Wayashev, Bam Mi Aras, Q. Oh, this is a sad story. You shocked it. Then no thought. 
and uh, kept on going up the route block from Zor. It's Zagor in the Septuagint, Zor. And uh, he kept on dwelling in mountains. And two Benato, two daughters, with him. Because <coughs> he had feared to dwell in Zoor. I think maybe he got the message after Sodom and Gomorrah. He was afraid to draw them to sin. When God, <coughs> over here, what did God, after the flood, what did God tell mankind to do? Scatter and multiply, spread out. What did they do? They built a big city. A big city that were going to have a one world, they had a one world language. They wanted to have a one world religion. This is the type of the uh, the great harlot in the book of Revelation is what happened over there. Okay? They didn't scatter. They built big cities. And this is very beautiful what happened here. The Lord, you know, he knows how to... He's got a sense of humor. He does. You don't think he's got a sense of humor? Look at the porcupine. Look at the skull. That's right. Giraffe. Look at some of these things. Whale. Sense of humor. God has got a sense of humor. Well, they built a big city, didn't they? Great big monument. One world religion. A great big temple that went up into the heaven way high. And they built it out of bricks. And they built great big cities and buildings out of bricks. And uh, it says that all of a sudden that God looked down and he said, boy, if we don't do something, they're going to just absolutely just kill themselves and each other and there will be no human race left on the earth. So i got to do something with these rats. i got to spread them out. So he confused their languages and then they went to different places, to different people, and they, of course, when you... When you uh, You would like to be able to speak your own language and understand each other. So that's basically what they did. The people that understood each other, they went and they communicated together and they separated themselves from the others. And not only that, but God did something else. He shook the place down. He began to divide the earth in the days of Felix. Like God divided the earth. And I can guarantee you for a long while after that, while the earth was being divided in earthquakes, they didn't have earthquake-proof houses. They didn't know what earthquakes were. But for a long time, they began to dwell in tents. Because they shook every building down and he spread them out. And there's where we come to talk All right? And there's where the Hamites went out ahead. They, spread, they were spread further than anybody else. They spread out further. Where did the Hamites go? To India, to America, to China, the Far East. Even down in south in the South Pacific, where you see all the Hamites going way out, and the further they went out away from everybody else, the more primitive they became. What do you mean primitive? I don't mean they were dumb. But they were first born. You go and you think about people that in South America, down in South America. You know they they were doing operations down there. They knew medicine. They used hypnosis to. Uh, put people under anesthesia. In China, they had great medicine in, in all the Far East. And down in, in the Aborigines, down in Australia and New Zealand, down in that area, they knew how to use nature. They lived close to nature. The American Indians here in this country, they knew more about medicine than the white people ever thought about. George Washington died of bad medicine. If they'd got him a Cherokee medicine man, he'd have lived for a little while longer. Because they knew how to they know how to use herbs and things. Seventy to eighty percent of all pharmaceuticals today come from Native American, North and South American, and Chinese medicine. They weren't dumb, but they lived very frugal lives. They only used what they needed to use. 
they spread out further. The furthest from the Fertile Crescent in the Middle East they are, the more primitive they would get. And basically, they were very dark too. Hamites descent. Let's go on. <coughs> and his daughters with him. And he feared to dwell in a city, even the city of Noor, okay? And he continued to live in a cave. He and two daughters. Zena. We have the word uh, Bene there, don't we, in that word? Bene. Bene means what? Son or according to the pattern. Okay? See the towel in that word? That means it is a girl. That's the feminine gender. That's how you put feminine on the end of it. And that's over. He and his two daughters. You ready to quit or you want to get one more verse? You want another one? Okay. 1931. Watamar. Ha B B Kira. El Hot Se Ra. Again. We ish. An Ha Aritz. Labo, Alenu, Kadarek, all Haaris. And she said, third person family singular, and she kept on saying, she kept trying to talk the firstborn, she kept on doing this. That because it says in Greek, He perbutera, the firstborn. But we get the word presbytery from that. That's the leader, the firstborn. Unto the younger. Our father uh, has become geriatric. Again, he has become geriatric. He's become old. And man, not, we're not around any guys. Okay, we're not around guys. These girls are ungodly, by the way. They're just, they don't think anything spiritual. I don't know why in the world a saved man didn't try to teach his daughters right from wrong. But they live. Where do they, where do they grow up? Not under the mark. And man not, we don't have, we ish, and a man, a male, not we have. In the land, ba'aretz, look at that word ba, see that word preposition, that means in, aretz, in the land. And then uh, to penetrate, to come into us, to penetrate us, la vu. All right, to come into us, to penetrate, Paul infinity construct, unto us, according to the way of all the earth. In other words, they said, we're not going to get pregnant because there aren't any men around here to get pregnant with and we need a man to impregnate us. We need, the Hebrew is very plainly, we need a man to go into us and spread seed. So, what are they going to do? All right, what are they going to do? The first of the inbred hillbillies. All right. <laughs> All right, next week, you want to start here? All right, we'll start there next week. <laughs> All right, the first of the hill. Is this the 16th? Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for studying God's Word with us tonight. I enjoy teaching and reading God's Word. It's a beautiful thing. It, uh, it's a beautiful thing and a glorious thing to get into God's Word in the original language. It just absolutely opens so many doors to deep Bible study. <coughs> All right, I want you to go out and do something eternal. We've got to be dismissed in prayer, though, before we go out and do that. Uh, Cindy, would you mind dismissing us in prayer, please? Dear Heavenly Father, I think for this time that we have together where we can come together and study your word and listen to what you have to say to us in your own words. And I just pray that we can take this now and apply it to our lives. And I just pray thank you for somebody like you. And I just give them the time to want to learn more about you and want to spread it to other people so that we also may be able to share your word with others. I just ask that you can with us during this week and give us opportunities to let others know how much you love us and care for us so that they may also want to know about you. I ask this in your name.
Now, if you want any of these booklets up here or study guides, if you don't have the money right now, you can owe me for it later.